catastrophic events at the close of the last ice age brought about the demise of a once mighty and very ancient ancestor civilization. In many places its memory has completely faded, but to the careful eye there are clues that still attest to its ancient glory. These clues, these ruins, may be easy to confuse with remains of more recent cultures, but distinguish themselves in subtle ways as being products of the higher minds of a distant golden age. Their sophisticated geometry, their celestial orientation, their complex symbolism is proof of their ancient high heritage. It is their best camouflage, a most effective veil which protects their timeless secrets from the destructive tendencies of minds of less enlightened times. Ancient Egypt appears to have inherited a legacy of high wisdom and science that imparted an understanding and a control over the material world that can only be described as supernatural. As we explore this legacy, we find its culmination in the sacred temples of ancient Egypt. We will see the temples not just as places of worship, but as objects of worship, as the instruments of worship, as vehicles for communion with the gods, as the embodiment of the gods. We will see the temples as the facilitators of a powerful magic and a blueprint to the great work. As we explore the sacred temples of ancient Egypt, we bring to life these ancient arcana and gain a new understanding of the most sacred of the temples. The temple in man. In our last episode, we examined the concept of the Yugas, a vast celestial cycle wherein our solar system and its inhabitants continually pass through the cosmic seasons, rising from the heavy depths of the Kali Yuga or Iron Age to the enlightened Satya Yuga or Golden Age, and then falling back again. The blueprints, the seeds of a lost magic, were passed down through the ages. The occult secrets and the sacred science inherited by the ancient Egyptians was the legacy of the higher minds of a distant golden age. The seed that becomes a tree that bears fruit which contains the seed for the next cycle. sacred science, the science of magic, the science of life, the science of death. The science of transformation, the art of becoming, the voice of creation, laws of beauty, and perhaps most importantly, the occult secrets that demonstrated the unity of all of the sciences, the unity that connects us to the universe which produced us.
Within the temples of ancient Egypt, these ancient secrets found their full expression. This is the true legacy. This is the seed. The temple was the teaching. multi-dimensional textbook that demonstrated or revealed not only the individual lessons which may comprise a particular school or discipline, but the way in which the lessons interrelated with one another to form their higher unity or integration of the sciences. In Egypt, in India, as well as later in the Christian cathedrals of the Gothic period, the temple was a book revealing an esoteric teaching. Temples, when examined individually, can be thought of as the different lessons in a unified cosmic curriculum. The Temple of Dendera is a repository of cycles. It immortalizes the connection between fertility and the cyclical heavens. This is where the new year is celebrated. In other words, here the, here the new year is born. So she said, well, yeah, of course it feels sort of dark and oppressive because it's the womb of time. One of the peculiarities that <clears throat> I've puzzled about ever since I've been studying Egypt is that you notice that the columns here are all shafts with the head of Hathor over it. And this whole thing is a representation of a musical instrument called the sistrum, the part on top. You'll see, well, we probably won't see it at the museum, but they have them, actual sistrums that I mean, you hold the shaft and you shake it. It's got a rattle up in the top part. And it's, you know, it's a celebratory thing. Um, but one of the things that puzzled me, two things puzzled me. One is the face of Hathor itself. Well, here it's all obliterated, but we'll see them inside where they're almost perfectly intact. The strange triangular face, um, Hathor, the totem animal. I hate to call it totem animal, but for lack of a better word, for Hathor is the cow. Well, the cow is, seems a peculiar animal to choose for a goddess among whose roles is sexuality, joy, song, dance, etc., etc. And there's the cow, but the cow actually is the is the animal that you might say par excellence represents the source of nourishment. And so Hathor represents the source of divine nourishment elsewhere, not here, but in Hatshepsut's temple, you'll see her actually the, in the shape of a cow, suckling, giving milk to the king, or queen as the case may be in Hatshepsut's. So all of this was formal, but the face itself of Hathor, that strange triangular face, is very un-Egyptian, and it's there from the beginning to the end. Hathor has this peculiar face, looks sort of Asiatic, and this strange triangular face looks very different from any of the other gods. And then the other peculiarity, or singularity, is that only Hathor, among all of the gods and goddesses, has a column to herself. All other columns are floral. They're papyrus or lotus or some combination thereof in Ptolemaic times. It gets more complicated. There are date palms and other kinds of vegetal, you know, vegetation all put together, synthesized. So, but columns are always represent the sky. The ceiling is always the sky. The floor is always the earth. The columns are the, you know, the animation, the animated universe um, connecting earth to sky. But only Hathor has a column entirely to herself. And I'm sort of wondering why Hathor, why not a, a Namon column or a Horus column or a Ra column and so on, but there isn't such a thing. But there's, so there's something specially significant to Hathor. And then on the last trip, I've just gone through this little wrap that I'm going through now, and we were inside, I'll show you when we get there, we're inside, and one of the women who was with us um, was a mother of four, three of whom were triplets, and she looked at the face of Hathor, 
And she said, oh, well, she said, well, look at the, look at the shape of that face. And then the next day, I got, this is not exactly correct, because I did it from memory. I traced it out of a book on Egyptian medicine. Do you, know, do you recognize that, what that is? Oh, the uterus. That's right. It's a uterus, and these are the fallopian tubes. And you look at the face of Hathor, and it is a uterus. Um, and she is, the, she is the mother of all, so she's the, she, is the cosmic, she is the cosmic goddess. On its ceilings, complex zodiacal and astronomical information is recorded. Now, over here are the famous, the famous astronomical, astrological ceilings. If you look carefully, above here, above my head is Leo, and you see half the zodiac. You follow along there. Over there are the scales. There's Libra. Somewhere in between, there should be with a sheaf of wheat. Virgo, and following down there, Scorpio, I think, yes, I can see Scorpio. Anyway, half the zodiac is there, half the zodiac is there. The other, all of this is, all of these are astronomical, are constellations and stars and so on. The astronomers know exactly which, you know, what, what all of these signs represent. But this is, so this is actually what, what, what these ceilings represent here are, is actually, it's a complete symbolic picture of the sky. It's a sort of, Greco-Roman planetarium, because here we have the here we have the zodiacal sky, the signs of the zodiac. When we get to the next register here, <clears throat> we get to the next register here. What's shown here are the are the um, are the decans, the, the the weeks of the year. In each of the months, there are there are twelve months, with divided into three decans, like astrology. You know, in astrology, the signs are divided into decans that the astrologers work with. So here we have, this is the solar sky. This is what gives us our, our, our weeks and our months. And it's the same on the other side. This is half the year and the other side is the, is the other half of the year. And over here are the lunar days. I think there are 14, 14, 28. I think they're each, each a day, a, a lunar day. So you have the hierarchical sky, the zodiacal sky or galactic sky, the solar sky and the lunar sky. So, so the whole thing is a complete sky picture, as it were, it's a, a map a map of the heavens. In a brilliant example of architecture conveying the interconnectedness of sciences, we see that Hathor Column is a giant sistrum, a musical instrument whose expression is through rhythm. The Hathor Columns at Dendera connect the floor to the zodiacal ceiling. The teaching contained in the columns connects to the teaching written on the ceiling. Their interaction in physical space demonstrates their ideological relationship as well. The supporting pillars of rhythm hold aloft the night sky. In fact, a knowledge of the rhythms of the heavens might be seen as the secret decoder necessary to understand the complex inscriptions. What was the connection between the stars and humanity? was more than a place of worship as we understand it today. The temple was the teaching. It was a three-dimensional lesson, a non-linear book. The temple spoke in symbol, volume, harmony, proportion, scale, and indeed in time.
The temple is a puzzle. The job, the joy of the initiate, is to solve its nested and concentric riddles. In many cases, a mystery once solved reveals a deeper enigma beneath. Schwaller's landmark work at Luxor, the result of 17 years on site, returned to the modern world a window into the sacred science of the ancients. A careful study of the temple's measurements revealed an altogether unexpected finding. This strange temple, which Schwaller would come to call the Temple of Man, was laid out according to the proportions of an idealized male frame. But the temple did not just reflect the patterns of the physical body. The architecture and the reliefs in the temple reveal the occult or metaphysical anatomy of man. It was a masterpiece of symbolist teaching and perhaps a massive instrument of magical correspondence. The temple was a repository of the great arcanum of the anthropocosm, the man cosmos, as above, so below. Man is made in the image of God. Man is not only the culminant creation of the universe, but in fact man is the universe. Here, of course, that Schwaller, that Schwaller developed his whole doctrine that he called the Anthropocosm, which is the, the man cosmos, because written into us is a platonic philosophy as well. Plato's sign over his gymnasium was, was a man know thyself. The idea being that if, if you really know everything there is to know about yourself, you understand everything that there is to know about the cosmos, the hermetic thing, as above, so below. In us are written all of the laws of the universe. This particular one, which is proportioned exactly to the to the proportions of the of the idealized male skeleton, male figure, um, contains or embodies all of the all of the laws pertaining to humanity and our role within the scheme. When you walk into these places. It's obvious to anybody with emotional faculties are actually working. Something very special is going on, but nobody seems to understand really, including the, you know, the people who study aesthetics and the art historians, why this stuff works. But, but the reason is actually not, not too difficult to explain. It, it works this way through, through vibration. Music makes the, the best analogy, actually, because we all know that music affects us emotionally, and we also know that it's sound waves and uh, very complex combinations of sound waves, vibration, frequency, harmony, measure, um, volume, all contribute to the effect that music produces. And so Bach produces one thing and Mozart another and the Rolling Stones something else again and the Liberace still something else but it's all done through through waveforms, through sound um, you don't tend to think of architecture that way, it was Goethe who said that architecture is frozen music, that's a very nice term and it's to be taken actually not metaphorically but literally because architecture produces the uh, visual wave the, uh, through, through light spectra, as it were. Um, it's also a vibratory phenomenon. Everybody knows that. that, that, that uh, we, we see our eyes respond to visual vibration. And not to think about architecture that way. But, of course, once it's, once, once it's even mentioned, you see instantly that, of course, yeah, that's, what, that's what produces, that's how architecture produces its effect, or its non-effect, or its ill effect. Now, the principles of the gods all have 
numbers associated with them. J.D. Bennett, your just follower, who called numbers the bears of meaning. It's a very, very interesting phrase. And it's through number that you can really, actually you can understand everything through number, if that's your way of looking at things. Not everybody's way of looking at things. But the gods are associated with certain numbers or number combinations. Those number combinations used by people who knew what they were doing. We don't know enough now to, to reproduce those effects, but we're starting to learn. At least some people are really taking this seriously and starting to study it. But the right combinations associated with that particular principle produce a piece of architecture that when you walk in, because of the vibratory nature of, of, of the building, evoke within you that principle. So when you walk in an Amon temple, that's one thing. This is the first temple you've been in. Most of you who've been here before, of course, know this. And if you go to Dendra, it's something else completely altogether different. You go to Hatshepsut, different again. The reason that those effects are different are, of course, because it's a, it's a different stone symphony that's being played. And you have to know how to put it together to produce this stone symphony. If you give the modern architect who's used to doing shopping malls and garages, and say, build us a temple that puts me in touch with divinity, you won't know what the hell to do. But these guys did. So when we're walking, when we're walking through this, this is what's happening. This is what we're responding to, except we don't, we don't really, all we know is that we're responding. We don't know why we're responding. But whoever was responsible for this, for this, um, for this temple, knew exactly why and knew how to evoke it. In revealing the great arcanum of the Anthropocosmos, the Temple of Luxor demonstrates the invisible principles which interact to create and perpetuate both conscious man and the conscious universe through the interplay of the physical, mental, spiritual, and archetypal realms. It showed the hologrammatic relationship between microcosm and macrocosm, between us and the conscious universe. A complex system of correspondences seems at every juncture to reveal and revivify another link with the ageless wisdom and occult teachings from the oldest cultures around the world. The entrance to the temple is through the front pylon. Just a word or two about temple architecture. This is classic temple architecture. That the, the, the there's a pylon in the front, and they're usually they're oriented either north, south, or east, west, but very specifically to a solstice or an equinox if they're east, west. Probably to stars if they're north, south, but I'm not sure which. And they always have the pylon like this, and there'd be a roof over it, and the center there. And what these represent actually is particularly apparent when it's an east-west one, because these represent what are called the twin peaks of the horizon. The symbol the Egyptian symbol for horizon goes like this, which means a waveform with with the solar disk in the center. And really what, what is what is being symbolically demonstrated there is is unity is unity dividing itself into into manifestation. In other words, spirit becoming matter. At, 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 this gets into number symbolism here, but one is the absolute, one is actually not really a number, according to Schroller. Schroller is very anti-zero. He thinks the invention of zero, which is an abstraction, is a big mistake. It's a downhill trip from there on in. But really what's being represented by the pylons here is, is matter, and in the center is the entrance into the temple, which is an east-west temple, and the sun rises up at certain times of the year, and so on sort of thing. It's, it's, you're marching... In, in performing the ceremonies at the temple, you're effectively reattaining unity within multiplicity. Every detail, every architectural feature is a symbolic component or lesson in the sacred sciences. The symbolic architecture of the classic pylon is a treasure of occult correspondences. It is said to represent the horizon, the division of unity into duality. The symbol evokes the image of an interworking of hemispheres which brings the dawn of intelligence symbolized as the illumination of the rising sun. An example from Hermeticism shows in pictorial form another aspect of the Arcanum, 
represented by this symbolic architecture. Here we see a visual metaphor of the divine child, born of a union of sun and moon at the pineal or third eye. The two caves represent not only the physical hemispheres, but the archetypal vesica Pisces of human intelligence, the duality in the unity that is intelligence. The rain, or divine dew of inspiration and intuition, is collected as it is provided by nature. It is yin. It partakes of the alchemical properties of water. It is the negative pole. The other side, the other inner cave, is the opposite process. It is the realm or hemisphere of logic, of separation. The steam separates the fine from gross. This is set, yang, alchemical fire. Expansive radiation, a positive pole. Through the balanced interworking of both types of intelligence, the androgyne, the divine child, is born. This deep archaean finds parallel in both the mental realm and the physical realm. The central location of the entrance to the temple corresponds physically and symbolically to the central pineal gland. As we enter and leave each new life and new body through the third eye, so too do we enter and leave the temple through this midpoint between the hemispheres. The mystery and revelation compounds in the symbolic proportion of the door itself. It is the embodiment of pi and phi ratios. It may be that the presence of this proportion in us and the universe is in itself our link to divinity. The they're skewing the axis. What they're doing is what the, they're, they're symbolizing, if I say they're symbolizing humanity in action rather than humanity at rest. That's all part and parcel of this much more profound overriding doctrine. In, in certain cases, the figure should be seen, or the, let's say the skeleton should be superimposed as a in profile and for certain others it's simultaneous we put it this way it's simultaneously in profile and frontal view just as actually just as the relief work is these represent the um the most the most yeah the most powerful powerful or positive aspect The joints between stones, which appear to the untrained eye to be random, are in fact intentional and in many cases serve as orientation clues to the trained initiate engaged in study of the temple. The knees are sometimes used to represent the back. In this relief is depicted the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, the two lands tied to the backbone of Egypt, the Nile. I remember I was telling you about the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. This is, this is what's being portrayed here, and it's a scene that you see over and over and over and over again in Egypt from beginning to end, because, as I said, it is not simply commemorating the Declaration of Independence or something like that. It is actually, it is actually commemorating the union of spirit and matter. See that he's, here you see the... You see the Iris of the, of the north and the lotus of the south, representing again the papyrus representing the vegetal world, the organic world, and the lotus representing its spiritualization. 
I'll talk more about the lotus later on, which also recently, some of you may know, they've discovered that the blue lotus of Egypt is actually hallucinogenic. <laughs> and I've been looking for some blue lotuses <laughs> <laughs> to see if it really works. But quite, quite splendidly complex. You see, this represents the Nile here, but at the bottom is the glyph very graphically representing the lungs. So in other words, the Nile represents re represents the breath of Egypt, as it were, quite formally. And so, you see, this, it's, it's, this is not a political act. This is, a, this is an esoteric symbol of, of, the, of, the, of the animation, of vivi the vivifying force, the breath of Egypt in, that is being that is being knotted with both spirit and matter, because without without matter, this is one of the problems with Christianity, they try to get rid of the of the physical world. And you can't do this, the Boy Swallow calls this the temple of man. The body is the is the temple in which the work gets carried out. No body or a body that isn't functioning correctly and it's very difficult to do the spiritual work. The analogy I sometimes use is you can't play celestial music with a cracked violin. So it's, it's important to keep it into some sort of shape. The femur is the largest bone in the body. It is responsible for the manufacture of most of the red corpuscles which feed the body. At the site located at the femur, the reliefs on the walls portray and invoke the processions which brought the celebration feast into the temples. It's in the thigh, particularly, what is it, the femur? That's the femur? Um, that most of, in the marrow of the femur, most of the, of the red blood, blood, um, blood, blood corpuscles are, are manufactured. So in other words, it's the... I don't. <laughs> All of the stuff is, and, and the same process is, 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 being, is being shown here. In other words, all of this processional stuff is, is leading up to the sustenance, or the, you might say, the spiritual sustenance of, of the entire enterprise, of the human frame. Because it's here that the marrow is being made. So it's, it's not just festival, but it's festival with a, with a much more profound esoteric significance that is at the same time absolutely in keeping with physiology. In other words, the essential nourishment of the, of the whole the whole frame is produced in the femur. Yeah, so it's physiologically correct and esoterically profound. Only the priests had access to the temple, and in certain uh, festivals during the year, the populace, the, the rabble, could come into the outer courtyard. Um, but for the most part, I mean, even then, only at certain times. But in these processionals, the the populace could could actually even you know, offerings to the, to the god being towed along. So in other words, it, and there were processionals all over the place. The Catholic Church inherited a lot of that stuff. I mean, anybody who's lived in Spain or Italy knows that there are processions all the time. In the symbolism here, we are given a very insightful clue to the mystery of the anthropocosm. When we see the individual blood cells as the nourishment of the larger body, we begin to also become aware of ourselves as energetic events as the cells of the greater body, exchanging nourishment for consciousness. We are the stuff of the universe. We are the body of the universe. We are the brain cells of the universe, and perhaps the taste buds. At the site corresponding to the belly, the birth of the king is announced. But this is the part that represents the, the midsection, the whole digestive tract, umbilical cord. And when Shrala was first developing this theory, uh, there was one Egyptologist 
of Alexandre Varil, who was interested in, but skeptical. And when once they worked out that this was supposed to represent the idealized male frame, one the, the central architrave there, um, somewhere here, one right in the center. Is, is it this one or this one? On the plan would correspond to the if the figure is profiled would correspond to the umbilical cord, to the you know, to the belly button, to the navel. And so nobody read the hieroglyphs. Lucy Lucy subsequently read the hieroglyphs, but Schwaller didn't and and um, Isha, his wife, was learning them but still still didn't have them down cold. So they went to Varil, who was friendly with them, and asked him to translate that one particular, particular that one particular architrave because they felt that it was kind of central. If, if, if it didn't say something there about birth, the whole theory was suspect. It was quite clear it was that architrave and not another one that corresponded. Because everything is exact to the to the navel. And sure enough, when Boril translated it, I've got it in the serpent, but I forget exactly what it is. Your but life it's starts. something to the effect of here the king is born and Your raised. Life starts him. and the king life kicks out and starts going. And, and life starts. <laughs> life, yeah. Like here, life. That's just something like that. Here, life begins. The king is raised to maturity and, kicks and out. leaves the temple crowned in glory. Words to that effect, something of that sort. So, in other words, it's right where, and you know, none of the other, uh, none of the other. Archetypes have tell that story, so it, you know, it's right in place exactly where it belongs. At the site of the lungs is the hypostyle hall. This is, this is the hypostyle hall. Hypostyle just means covered hall. Each of the temples has a hypostyle hall. It represents symbolically, more on this another time, but it represents symbolically the papyrus swamp in which Hathor uh, safeguards and, and, and nourishes Horus, who safeguards and takes care of Horus until he's raised to manhood and can avenge the murder of his father Osiris. So all hypostyle walls represent that papyrus swamp. But in this one, in this one alone, at the bases of these columns are, are cut the, the phases of the moon. It starts at the top there, just there's nothing. New moon. On this one here, you transfer away all these stones, it would be a crescent that went like this. A crescent. On the next column, over there, is the half moon. So like this. And then on the final column, the detail bar is to show a full moon on coming out from the column, but there's a no, there's a full moon. Now this has certainly no decorative effect whatsoever, just cut into the surface of the, of the paving stones below. Now on the plan, as well as plan, this hypostyle hole represents, um, <coughs> represents the lungs, actually. And I mean, the lungs and the heart, the heart pumps the blood, the lungs, it's all are associated the lungs with the phases of the moon and the heart with the sun, which is common to all cultures, really. But it's there's a there's a lung there's a lung um, moon cor correlation, and so it's here and here only only this hypostyle where we have the phases of the moon. This is the part of the temple that actually corresponds to the heart. And interestingly enough, it was appropriated by the, by the early Copts and the Romans and turned into a church. It's a peculiarity of early Coptic um, Christian uh, uh, temple building or temple appropriation that in the various temples, they almost invariably chose a part of the temple that would have been specifically and particularly sacred to the ancient Egyptians who built the temples themselves. And in this particular little, let's say, heart chakra here, um, we can see still the remains of um, frescoes, Roman frescoes painted along the wall in this way, curiously anomalous, out-of-place-looking Roman arch. 
um, where they actually they did a bit of original construction. This little chamber corresponds on the plan to the vocal cords. And it's in this chamber that the five sacred names of the king are written. And on this wall here, a very remarkable scene. It's called the scene of the theogamy, or marriage to the gods. In it, Amon and the queen, Mutemoya, the mother of Amenhotep III, are seated on a symbol to the sky, supported by two goddesses, Selkit, with a scorpion emblem, Neith, with a crossed arrows, whose own feet also don't rest upon the ground, denoting the holy spiritual nature of the scene. On the right are Amon's words, on the left, Mutemoya's, the queen's responses. And what is being depicted here in this scene is <clears throat> Amon telling the queen that she will shortly give birth to a divine king, to a divine being. This scene is explained by Egyptologists as a political device by Amenhotep to justify his accession to the throne. Actually, what it is, is the Annunciation. Uh, what comes later in Christianity, the Annunciation by the God of the coming birth of a divine being. And so we see written into Egyptian symbolism in the wall of a temple built in 1300 BC, a central aspect of the later Christian doctrine. This is the Holy of Holies, the central sanctuary from which the rest of the temple, um, which generates the seed, the sanctuary might be called the seed of the actual temple. In this case, the sanctuary is not the original one. It was put in there later by, uh, by Alexander the Great, actually, in 300 uh, BC. But originally, it's the site of the original sanctuary. In yogic practice, when people chant Om, the idea is to get the those sinus passages resonating and it's 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 that actually that produces or that is that is part of the of initiatic pra practice of of raising consciousness of bringing it up into the pineal gland so curiously enough in the plan the sanctuary might be called the seed of the actual temple the, the center you might say of the of the of the growth of the temple The temple of Luxor was in every respect the living image of man. It began from a seed which contained the plan for its ultimate becoming. It grew in time according to the laws of the geometry of life. Temple architecture is often referred to as living architecture. Was this a functional necessity for the temple to perform its task? Their very architecture incorporates an unfolding in time as well as space. Did they know something about time that we don't? This is called the Hall of Twelve Columns. Uh, the, twelve, the Twelve Columns representing the 12 hours of day and the 12 hours of night. On the plan, in Schwaller's plan, this corresponds to the optical centers, the left brain, right brain, where the nerves cross, where the right eye perceives, or the brain, the left brain transforms what the right eye sees, and the right brain transforms what the left eye sees. Significantly enough, the 12 columns also correspond to the <coughs> 12 optical nerves uh, found in this center anatomically. So this is actually, this is a part of the, of the accumulated evidence that Chawla put together uh, demonstrating that this entire temple is me meant to represent the human body, not as, a, not as an exact reproduction, in other words, a statue is an exact reproduction of the human body, but that this is, you might say, a kind of a gigantic library in which are written all of the, not just the functions of the human body, but the functions as manifestations of the cosmic principles upon which the human body is constructed by divine powers, not by accident.
it appears quite distinctly that the secret pharaonic teaching is based on the vital functions for which the organs are the living symbols, in the sense explained previously. There can no longer be any doubt of the ancients' knowledge with regard to what might be called spiritual metabolism. From the assimilation of nourishment to the liberation of the energy or spirit manifested in the intellectual faculties and the powers of consciousness. We see in this the symbolization of the eye and its relation to the center of visual consciousness. This little sanctuary uh, represents the, the top chakra. Uh, it's one of three representing the higher glands of the, of the brain or within the skull and has a very interesting geometrical structure, this entire, uh, this entire it's a like triple sanctuary here, um, based upon very rigorous and elegant sacred geometry, incorporating constants like the roots of, roots of two, three, and five. And this particular little room here is proportioned precisely eight to nine. Eight to nine is the proportion of the first note in the musical scale. So the entire temple actually, as Shvala demonstrates, has a musical significance as well as a profound philosophical and metaphysical significance. Music is effectively built into this structure in its proportions, measures, and stone harmonies. The pineal gland in, in, um, in countless statues of the pharaohs, uh, they're shown with wearing the royal diadem with a rearing cobra, rearing precisely out of the place of the, of the pineal gland, the, the famous third eye, and the the cobra in this context represents the risen kundalini energy, the, the energy that, starting from the base of the spine, travels up the spinal column, illuminating the pineal gland and giving access to divine light or higher consciousness, which is, of course, the aim of all mystical and initiatic practices. The enigmatic cobra rising from the third eye of the pharaoh is so prevalent that it is almost synonymous with Egyptian art. What did it mean? The knowledge of the subtle body demonstrated here with the accomplishment of the risen Kundalini echo and amplify the similar arcana at the center of Hindu and Asian sacred teachings. The perfection of earthly material and its transformation into a higher spiritual manifestation is symbolized by the risen kundalini snake. We see a number of examples of this secret science, sometimes called inner alchemy, in the esoteric symbolism of the ancient Egyptian temples. The Egyptian knowledge of the subtle body or spiritual body and its interworking with the physical body seems to have been present throughout its history. This is the heart of the secret behind countless ancient cultures. Sexual energy, life energy redirected and refined for the creation of a higher spiritual presence. In parallel with tantric, eastern and alchemical symbolism, as well as many modern magical disciplines, the risen snake of Kundalini is another indicator of the high universal science from history so remote that it seems to be the seed from which all our oldest extant cultures came into being. In ancient documents and sacred teachings passed down through the ages, the knowledge, the art of becoming a higher or more perfected form on the spiritual plane finds its echo as one of the legacies of lost science contained in the temples. Why was this fantastically complicated temple undertaken? Was there a technical function that the temple performed 
or assisted in or facilitated? What does this say about the minds capable of such a design, not to mention the bewildering use such a structure might have afforded? The use of higher dimensions in the symbolic architecture of the temple is necessary to capture the higher dimensional nature of the science revealed here. It is difficult to see this as anything but the product of higher minds. The temple not only drew attention to or demonstrated a knowledge of the subtle body, but further showed its role in the deeper arcanum of the anthropocosmos. We share what might be called a hologrammatic relationship with the consciousness of the universe, each an octave of the other, each sharing in and influencing the state of the other. As above, so below. The analogy of the hologram is an important one. It is a useful tool in understanding our relationship with the universe. The role of DNA in our bodies is very similar to the example of the hologram. The tiniest amount of our living tissue contains DNA, which is a highly compact representation or map or seed containing the potential to recreate the whole organism. Again, turning to the revelation of the anthropocosm, we see ourselves, our individual and collective consciousness, as a hologrammatic cell comprising the higher mind of the conscious universe. As above, so below. The conscious universe and conscious man are one and the same. The microcosm and the macrocosm are not only in the image of one another, they each contain one another, they are one another. The teaching of the anthropocosm raises the question, if we are a hologram of the universe, is the universe also like us? Does it too have its periods of waking and sleeping? The one trait that seems to be common side effect of consciousness is sleep. All conscious beings sleep, and perhaps all dream as well. The conscious universe and we, as conscious holograms or cells in its body, may well be dreaming during the heavy and confusing Kali Yuga. Are we, as the brain cells of the living universe, asleep? hibernating metaphysically during the winter of the lower yugas, only to return to full wakefulness as spring returns? Do we flower in the summer? Is this what is meant by the golden age? The universe awakes from an extended slumber, shakes off its checkered dreams, and returns to its waking passions to take pleasure from and bring pleasure to us, its firing brain cells, its hungry and hedonistic taste buds. We can think of the microcosm as man and the macrocosm as the universe, but as above, so below, might also be expressed as inside, so outside. There is a teaching from Masonic law that shows the world outside to be an echo or reflection of the world inside. Conflicts are seen as outward manifestations of inner imperfections. The interrelationship of inner and outer worlds 
and our ability to control one with the other is the very definition of magic. This is the power conferred upon the initiate through an understanding of the anthropocosm. Yet the ramifications of the anthropocosm go even deeper. Awakening is the awakening of intelligence of the heart. Reason is born with us. If we give it preponderance over cerebral intelligence, over the mental, it will tell us everything, for it is the intelligence of the universe. Our intuition is the intelligence of the universe. This is the hidden blessing bestowed by the anthropocosm. The wisdom of the universe is at our disposal when we learn to listen to our hearts. The temple was a sacred teaching and a magical instrument. It demonstrated and perhaps in some way helped to facilitate man's connection to the universe. The intention of the master builders far surpasses a simple figuration. Since we are dealing with man, and since the architecture takes into account the channels and vital centers of the human body, the meaning of the figurations in sculptures and bas relief is equally relevant. It is a magnificent lesson for everyone to be able to study across time the knowledge already millennia old bequeathed to the builders of the true temples. Every vital center is indicated. The glands and the vital connections between the organs represented in the scenes reveal their correspondence with the neaters that govern them. This throws much light on one of the true meanings of the pantheon. As each netter is revealed to us, we recognize and acknowledge its presence and role within us. We can perfect the temple within by making it a true mirror of the Egyptian temple a place fit to be inhabited by the gods. If the temple is built according to the timeless methods, the gods will in fact reside there. Catastrophic events at the close of the last ice age brought about the demise of a once mighty and very ancient ancestor civilization. In many places its memory has completely faded, but to the careful eye there are clues that still attest to its ancient glory. 
These clues, these ruins, may be easy to confuse with remains of more recent cultures, but distinguish themselves in subtle ways as being products of the higher minds of a distant golden age. Their sophisticated geometry, their celestial orientation, their complex symbolism is proof of their ancient high heritage. It is their best camouflage, a most effective veil which protects their timeless secrets from the destructive tendencies of minds of less enlightened times. Ancient Egypt appears to have inherited a legacy of high wisdom and science that imparted an understanding and a control over the material world that can only be described as supernatural. As we explore this legacy, we find its culmination in the sacred temples of ancient Egypt. We will see the temples not just as places of worship, but as objects of worship, as the instruments of worship, as vehicles for communion with the gods, as the embodiment of the gods. We will see the temples as the facilitators of a powerful magic and a blueprint to the great work. As we explore the sacred temples of ancient Egypt, we bring to life these ancient arcana and gain a new understanding of the most sacred of the temples. The temple in man. episode we examine the concept of the yugas, a vast celestial cycle wherein our solar system and its inhabitants continually pass through the cosmic seasons, rising from the heavy depths of the Kali Yuga or Iron Age to the enlightened Satya Yuga or Golden Age, and then falling back again. The blueprints, the seeds of a lost magic, were passed down through the ages. The occult secrets and the sacred science inherited by the ancient Egyptians was the legacy of the higher minds of a distant golden age. The seed that becomes a tree that bears fruit which contains the seed for the next cycle. sacred science, the science of magic, the science of life, the science of death. The science of transformation, the art of becoming, the voice of creation, laws of beauty, and perhaps most importantly, the occult secrets that demonstrated the unity of all of the sciences, the unity that connects us to the universe which produced us. Within the temples of ancient Egypt, these ancient secrets found their full expression. This is the true legacy. This is the seed.
The temple was the teaching. A non-linear, multidimensional textbook that demonstrated or revealed not only the individual lessons which may comprise a particular school or discipline, but the way in which the lessons interrelated with one another to form their higher unity or integration of the sciences. In Egypt, in India, as well as later in the Christian cathedrals of the Gothic period, the temple was a book revealing an esoteric teaching The temples, when examined individually, can be thought of as the different lessons in a unified cosmic curriculum. The temple of Dendera is a repository of cycles. It immortalizes the connection between fertility and the cyclical heavens. This is where the new year is celebrated. In other words, here the, here the new year is born. So she said, well, yeah, of course it feels sort of dark and oppressive because it's the womb of time. One of the peculiarities that <clears throat> I've puzzled about ever since I've been studying Egypt is that 